Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual Commonwealth Club program with Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League and former mayor of New Orleans and Stockton, California Mayor Michael Tubbs. This program is co-presented by Inforum. I am Ladaris Cordell, retired Superior Court Judge, member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, and your moderator for this program. In the Bay Area, the Commonwealth Club has suspended its in-person programming, but we are holding special virtual, virtual programming, including this one. You can learn about these offerings and support the club at the club's web website, commonwealthclub.org. To our viewing audience, we want you involved, as is standard for Commonwealth Club programs. If you'd like to submit questions to me, add your questions to the text chat area, and I will try to integrate as many of them as possible into the program. Please also share and like this program on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And now let's get to today's very important subject. As Americans continue to grieve, protest, and cry out over the death of George Floyd and the recent deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, many wonder if this will be the tipping point for permanent change to the American justice system. And if not, what does the future hold for civil rights and American democracy? The Commonwealth Club will hold many programs focused on race and justice over the coming weeks. We hope to provide solutions and steps that all individuals can take to promote equal justice in America. Today, we're going to have a generational discussion with two prominent African-American leaders. As the head of the National Urban League, the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization, Mark Morial is a leading voice in the battle for jobs, education, housing, and voting rights equity. He previously served as the highly successful mayor of New Orleans, as well as the president of the United States Conference of Mayors. In a statement issued in conjunction with leaders of the Urban League's 90 affiliates, serving 300 communities in 36 states and the District of Columbia, Mr. Morial said the following, the cries for justice have gone unheard long enough. The Urban League movement has proposed specific recommendations for police reform and accountability. The widespread use of body cameras and dashboard cameras, revision of use of force policies, officer training and hiring standards, and the immediate appointment of independent prosecutors to investigate police misconduct. But even more than these measures, we need a revision of our culture. He continues, it's a culture that teaches a white woman walking her dog in Central Park that racially motivated police brutality is a weapon she can use to enforce her own preferred social code. As we pursue these measures to reform the police in our communities, we call upon all community leaders, elected officials, corporate leaders and social institutions to join us in pursuing policies that promote racial reconciliation. In 2016, Michael Tubbs was elected to serve as the mayor of the city of Stockton, California. Upon taking office in January, 2017, Mr. Tubbs at the age of 25 became both Stockton's youngest mayor and the city's first African-American mayor. Michael Tubbs is also the youngest mayor in the history of the country, representing a city with a population of over 100,000 residents. Mayor Tubbs has said, I'm a young black man with a black wife and a black son. I have a black father who's been in jail for the last 27 years. It's definitely personal. For people who don't understand, I think part of it is reckoning with the fact that this system, the institutions that worked fine for you and your family, it doesn't work and it hasn't historically worked for a lot of people. And he continues, 
And that's what people are upset about. And that's what people want to see changed. Today, we'll discuss the next steps Americans can and must take. Welcome, Mr. Marial, and welcome, Thank you. Mayor Tubbs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. All you right. Thank you. Better than you. You read me better than I read me. I thought it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Tubbs. Sounds, sounds so good, I, I'm, I'm delighted that you are both here. Um, and uh, let's just jump right into things. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to know how each of you has been doing in the last week since the May 25th murder of uh, Mr. Floyd. So, uh, Mr. Marial, how have you been doing since that time? Yeah, first of all, Judge, Judge, thank you and congratulations sure. on your, your history making career. And I want to thank the Commonwealth Club. Uh, and also thank Evelyn Dill Saber, uh, a friend who contacted me about participating today. I've been both energized and outraged. I was outraged. I woke up uh, and looked at the video on the CBS Morning News, and my heart was literally in my throat. I wanted to jump through the television and knock Officer Chauvin off of Mr. Floyd's neck. That's how I felt. I jumped up, I stood up, I walked within two feet of the TV, and I was saying, get off of him, you blankety blank. I mean, it was though I was on the sidewalk watching as this man and as the citizens were there on the sidewalk saying, he's bleeding, can I check his pulse? And then the officer in the back is taunting him by saying, get up, bro, get in the car. So I'm outraged, but I'm energized. Right. I'm energized at the outpouring of uh, protest, the outpouring of purpose, the outpouring of passion, uh, that this is a time for America to wake up. Not only is America responding, the globe is responding. Hungary, Paris, London. I've received calls from New Zealand and Australia uh, for media there. So this is a, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is a movement and not a moment and an important time when, you know, people can reconstruct and rebuild and, and, and address the essential issues, the essential Thank issue. You. And right now, yeah. So let, let me just go to, to Mayor Tubbs. How have you been doing? Well, first, Judge, uh, so good to see you again. We met when you were inducted into the Stanford Hall of Fame. And uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. President, Mr. CEO, it's always great to, to hear Thank you, your, man. your wisdom. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's been, it's been an interesting um, couple of weeks, Judge, if I'm honest, only because, you know, like James Baldwin said, to be Black in this country and halfway conscious, you're in a perpetual state of rage. So I'm generally angry at the state of affairs, at the poverty, the bad schools, the violence, the police violence, et cetera. So it was a little bit difficult for me the first couple of days when George Floyd happened, when all this new energy was brought to the mix. Because part of me was saying, well, where were you when? Like, where were you last week when we had Black folks dying from COVID-19? Where were you the week before when we had uh, the majority of homeless people in the state as Black people? We're in, in that, and I just check myself and say, but you know what? It, it's a good thing that, that, that people are becoming newly awoken. And maybe then we can move faster in, in producing those changes. I think as a, as a mayor of a city of 315,000 people um, and, and who's in charge of kind of police and public safety, um, but also as a 29-year-old Black man, um, it's been tough to kind of straddle both worlds and not be fully trusted when I meet with my officers and also not be fully trusted when I meet with the protesters because of the position I hold and figuring out sort of how you use the space to have hard conversations, but also bring people together, not for peace for the sake of peace, but more towards justice. Like how do I bring the community together to do the work necessary to answer the cries of what we're hearing from the young people who have been leading and protesting constructively in, in our city. So I'm exhausted um, and, a little bit, and a little bit upset, um, but also hopeful because I think we're getting closer to where we should be. So Mr. Morial talked about his reaction when he watched the video. If you watched the video of the murder 
of Mr. Floyd, how did you feel? What's your reaction to it? I have not watched a um, lynching um, of a black man um, since Oscar Grant when I was a freshman in college. Um, Cause my reaction to that was visceral and, and, and it took months. So I have, Larry just, I, I can't, I, I can't watch it. Cause I know if I watch it, my, my rage will become not constructive. And I would probably almost be paralyzed and unable to think and, and move and do what I need to do. So I just, I, I, I it's hard for me. I, I just refuse to watch any of them. Um, Got it. So I know that uh, when I, I did watch it and what I, I mean, it was horrifying, but what struck me so much was that the officer who had his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck knew that he was being videoed because there was a bystander, a 17-year-old female who was a heroine in all of this, who recorded him. And he looked up at her. And in response, he pressed his knee harder into Mr. Floyd's neck. And what that said to me was that he knew he was being uh, recorded and he knew that recordings go viral and it had no impact no at all. effect uh, no effect and so what that said to me it had no effect because he did not believe that would be any consequences for his behavior so you know we'll talk a little bit later about reforms but I- i'm concerned where people think that cameras you know they're really going to make a difference well this was there was a camera on this whole scene and it didn't seem to bother them but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Morial, uh, you talked a little bit about how you've been contacted from people around the world. And I want to just let people know I'm going to be looking off to my side in a bit because mm-hmm. I'm getting some uh, questions in from those mm-hmm. who are watching us now. And I'll be incorporating those in. So I don't mean to be rude, but I'll kind of look over sometimes to see what questions are coming up. Mm-hmm. So you talked about getting phone calls from around the world in response to everything happening here. Why do you think, and I'll ask this of both of you, why do you think now so many people are so upset and protesting this murder when there have been so many earlier murders of African Americans by police? If this time is different, why? I uh, first want to, I want to respond to that this way. You never know when a spark will be lit. You never know when an incident or an event is going to provoke this type of response and outrage. And I think, and and I sense that the outrage has been building. You know, back to Trayvon Martin, we had protests. Michael Brown, there were protests. Eric Garner, there were protests. Tamir Rice's name and Walter uh, Mosley. A lot of names come to mind. In there's a common thread through all of these cases, and that is no accountability whatsoever. And I think people, it just, this one struck a nerve, and I'll tell you why I think it struck a nerve. There was no room for ambiguity here. Not even a moment of ambiguity. Because when you looked at the original tape that the 17-year-old young lady provided, and then you added the dash cams and the security tapes of buildings nearby, you could see that not at any instance did Mr. Floyd resist, push back, use force, or say anything provocative that may have uh, uh, incited the police. And I think people saw that, and I think there, 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 come, there come times uh, when humanity, people's humanity is touched, and this thing, this hit a nerve it was not predictable, and you're right, there have been so many instances. You know, 1,200 black people have been killed by the police since 2015, about 125 of them unarmed. This is the framing, this is the picture, these are the stats. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I fight, the mayor said, you know, you can get exhausted, you can't get weary, and that is absolutely true in these struggles and in these fights. Uh, but what I try to remind myself is that we've got to be both energized and remember that this is a long marathon. This work and that and this fight is so so long. It's not automatic. It's not immediate. Mayor Tubbs. Yeah, I, I I think that the video for sure, but also just the moment we've been in for the last four years. You have this 
this incident, um, a series of incidents happening, but at the same time, you have someone in the White House who a couple of weeks before uh, um, have been saying crazy things. They immediately after said, when the looting starts, the, the, the shooting starts, you have someone in the White House who has emboldened kind of white supremacists and had caused white supremacists, you know, Nazis, very fine people um, with, with, with Charlottesville. So I think you, you have that fermenting the rise in hate groups and white supremacists over the past couple of years. You have COVID-19, which has a lot of people stressed and anxious and, and out of work and not in school and, and angry and, and doing and, and figuring out what, what the future looks like and kind of laying bare the savage inequities in our society. And on top of that, you, you have this brazen act of not just sort of the lack of accountability um, with, with quote unquote bad apple actors and not just kind of the issue of police brutality, but, but again, the, uh, a statement of, of, of white supremacy, the, the, the proverbial knee on the neck. And I think that just broke a chord with, with everyone. Um, from black folks who are who've been protesting for the past 400 years, I tell people all the time, if it was up for black folks in racism, we would have been did it. Right? We we we've been there. We've always been there. We've been consistent with, with our position. Um, but but seeing sort of some of the the, the other folks, the letters I receive in my inbox from from white folks or, or other groups has made made this moment different. But I think it's because it's the weariness of the Trump years. It's COVID 19. It's it's a yearning for something more hopeful and it's reminded like, oh no, we have a lot of work to do. Got it. So I, I wanna talk uh, just for a little bit about uh, systemic racism. Uh, this past week, a top uh, federal official in the current administration said there is no systemic racism in policing. Uh, and I think if I pose that to you, I, I can kind of predict what your answers are gonna to be to me. Uh, this person also said that there's no systemic racism, they're only bad apples. Um, so it, before we get to just your reaction to that, um, I, you know, I believe that every African American in this country has had at least one experience where you have been a victim of the systemic racism with respect to, to policing. If I'm correct, I'd like you to, you know, tell just very briefly talk to people and tell us just one experience maybe you have had or you, you know, where you have been the subject of what you believe is the racism in policing or you were witness to. So, and I don't want to put you on the spot. I mean, if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, but my belief is I, I cannot believe that each of you has not gone through your life thus far and not had any kind of an, an incident like that happen to you. Either of you? I'll go first. And, you know, I could talk about things that happened as a teenager, but let me talk about something that happened more recently, because we moved from New Orleans to uh, New York a little over 15 years ago. And of course, in New Orleans, you know, I was I had 100 percent name recognition and everyone knew me. New York is a different place. Uh, I moved there and we were out in New Jersey driving with my son. He's 18 now. He must have been six or seven. I think he was in the back. I don't even know if he was in a car seat. He might have been younger than that. And an officer pulled me over. And uh, big deal, officer pulled me over. I go to, I know he's going to want to drive his license, an insurance card. And I put down the window. First thing he said in a very hostile tone was, why did you run that stop sign back there. And I looked at him and I didn't say a word. And he said, I'm asking you a damn question. Why did you run that stop line back, stop sign back there? And I looked at him and I didn't say anything. And then I finally said, he didn't say anything. Then I looked at him and said, you know, officer, I think right now you should do the job that you were trained to do. And I think for a moment, he looked at me, he caught himself, he said, uh, uh, let me have your driver's license, or your insurance and your registration. I took it between two fingers, I gave it to him and I said, that's exactly what you were trained to do. Here you are. Now, you know, it's a small thing, but what that officer was seeking to do was to incite my anger, incite an argument, escalate a traffic stop. Now I knew, I know 
from you know my my career and my work both as a lawyer, uh, an advocate, and also as a mayor who oversaw a police reform effort and has probably spoken at the police academy, you know, fifty times. That the way he approached me was absolutely inappropriate and wrong. Small things. If I could, if I didn't have this, the, the, the ability to look at this officer who's probably 15 years younger than me and defuse it, you know, defuse it, uh, it could have been a confrontation. He could have pulled me out of the car. One thing, if I had been argumentative. And, and I don't think when he looked at the car, he realized I had a child in the back seat. Uh, and so the way the story ended is he went and he stayed and he went back to his car he must have stayed there 15 minutes. I mean, I'm like cool in my heels saying, what's going on, what's going on? Finally, he comes back and says, you know, excuse me, uh, 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 do you need anything? Is there anything you need? Uh, I said, no, officer, I just kind of got turned around. I'm new to the area. You have a great day and I'll see you later. And I drove off. Now he may have gone in the back and figured out who I was and got nervous and got embarrassed, but you know, those types of indiscretions mm -hmm being treated rudely, being talked down to, uh, officers being nasty for no reason. Uh, these are, you know, they call them, uh, I guess the, the term is microaggressions. Uh, but if I go back to being a, being a young man and being a teenager growing up, I could, I could have, I have incidents that are probably worse than that. But the point is, is that even me as a grown, professional black man could get talked to by a 34 or 35 year old young white officer as though I was dirt or as though I not bound to respect. And I mean, I think that's part of the culture. Exactly. Part of the culture exactly. is, is I can do it. I can get away with it. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll just tell a fib when I'm asked about it. If he files a complaint, I'll tell a fib. Right, got it. Mayor, Mayor Tubbs. Yeah, I, th I think definitely those microaggressions, but I was on city council actually. Me and my friend um, were, were out in the Bay Area um, and he, the bouncer mistook him for someone else. And all I know, all of a sudden there's like 10 pol police officers surrounding my friend who was just unarmed, very six foot two, dark skinned brother. Um, and he was, he wasn't, he didn't de-escalate. He was talking um, and saying, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. But all of a sudden there's like five gu guns are drawn and he's literally unarmed literally outside, literally just, just talking. And I remember having to go and talk to the officers and they got a little bit rough with me. <laughs> and I wasn't in my city. So it didn't matter if I was a city council member. But in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, if I wasn't here and if it's my friend and these five officers, that can end really, really, really badly. Um, and then it, just two years ago, while I was a mayor, my little brother was a victim of police brutality and was beat up um, during SantaCon um, in, in the Bay Area after he got into an, an altercation, um, an argument with um, a, a, a white patron at a bar. And my brother is five foot seven. My brother is 100 and maybe 35 pounds. My brother is not <laughs> physically <laughs> intimidating. And he sent me, and he was in jail for two, two days and just beat up, his eyes beat up. and. They just, he was supposed to go to court last week, but they decided to drop the, drop the case because they charged him with, with assault of, of, of an officer. So again, to your point, this is not just theoretical, but it's visceral. It's the lived experience of me, of so many other, almost to your point, everybody who has the interaction with law enforcement who is black, at some point, that interaction will be covered by the racism that permeates our, our society. Right. And I, I do want to give one personal example. Uh, I was in a car in Palo Alto and uh, pulled over and ordered out of my car. And there were two other people in the car, African-American males. We were ordered uh, to stand up against a wall. This is at a major intersection and spread eagle facing the wall. And when I turned around, there were at least three police cars all officers out with guns drawn aimed at our heads. Um, I was uh, told to turn around and uh, one officer shouted, if you turn around again, we'll blow your head off. Um, they searched our car without a warrant. 
And uh, when we were allowed to finally turn around and put our hands down, we were told, and I asked, what is this about? I was told there was a report of three black males on foot running from a place that apparently they had robbed. Um, and this was a long time ago, but what made it significant for me is that I had just graduated from Stanford Law School and passed the bar. I was a lawyer. I was trying to do everything that this society has said you should do in order to be successful. And in the eyes of the police at that moment, uh, it didn't matter. It just didn't matter at all. And, and I was terrified to this day. If I see an officer, a police car coming with sirens on, everything in my system just goes, yes, uh, yes. starts to panic. And and so when people say this is not systemic, they don't know what they're talking about or they're lying. Uh, so let, let me move on. There is discussion now about defunding the police, abolishing the police. And I wanted to get your input and your, your thoughts about this. Now, I, and let me just throw something out. I think the word defund is not the right word. I think what people mean is to divert funds from policing budgets to other things. That's my my sense about what they mean and or reinvest funds from police budgets into other things. And then there's the other side that says, um, forget that, just completely abolish, dismantle and reconstitute some sort of policing in, in America. So I'd love to get your input on that. And then after you answer that, I'm going to, I've gotten a couple questions from our listeners already, and then I'll kind of bring those in. So talk to us about defunding or diverting or reinvesting and ab abolishing or dismantling policing. You want me to go first? Uh, whoever. And uh, just take so a couple take, minutes and then we'll I, go I think on. you, you, you characterize it. Defund police is a slogan uh, that's prominent at many, many rallies. I take it to mean that in communities today, we need to prioritize funding other than policing. Anyone who's run a city or been inside a, a municipal government knows that typically the way budgeting goes is that you, you say you fund the police first and you fund the fire department first, you fund the public safety infrastructure first, and then everything else become secondary. And I think what this does is it challenges that notion. It challenges the notion that a policing strategy is number one, the only or the best strategy to confront violence. I think it is also a commentary on the fact that policing has now encroached into uh, responding to homelessness and mental health issues, uh, as opposed to an investment in social workers and mental health professionals, an investment in youth and youth programs, an investment in enhancement of schools and uh, after school initiatives, an enhancement of the quality of housing. So I think it really talks about, and look, Alicia Garza, who is the founder of Black Lives Matters, publicly indicated that her approach is, the, is that. This is, a, this is a conversation. You know, abolish the police is a very, very uh, interesting and provocative thing. But look, black communities need public safety. Black communities need protection. Gun violence remains a problem in many American cities. Uh, uh, sexual assaults remain a problem in many American cities. The question is, does policing need to be thought about differently? The tactics that you described, being pulled over and stopped, being put against the wall, be with guns pulled for no reason, is the kind of policing that's got to cease. It's got to end. We need a community-oriented policing in cities, but we also need, and I think the, 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 the verdict on the last 20 years is, we've de-emphasized investing in people. We've, de we've, we've de-emphasized investing in those things uh, that uh, that build community and build family and, and build uh, quality of life. And I really think that's what it is. I think it's a redirection or a reprioritization. So I don't, you know, even if some people may take it, some activists may take it at face value, I don't take the slogan at face value because you have to have 
uh, public safety is the term I use. And under the rubric of public safety, policing is a component, but there are multiple other components if you're talking about public safety and quality of life in urban communities. But this is also a moment to reimagine uh, what public safety and policing should be all about. And I think the, that's the excitement. What are new techniques and strategies? I'll, I'll say one last thing. New York City just recently said that the police would no longer be responsible for, if you will, enforcing uh, street vendor licensing and registration requirements. We're gonna put it in the hands of a non-police a non agency. Uh, well, policing probably should never have been involved uh, in enforcing those rules, except to the extent that it created a real threat to public safety. So you've got communities that are talking about creating crisis intervention units to respond to homelessness, to respond uh, in lieu of the police in many instances. So this is gonna be a, a healthy, uh, encouraging, debate, but I think the idea that policing is going to completely go away uh, is not what most people want or what most people have, but absolutely okay. got to be changed. Mayor Tubbs, where do you stand on these ideas? I remember my first month as a council member, I went on a ride along with our police department at night. In the span of six hours, we were social workers, we were therapists, we were anti-poverty programs, we were homeless prevention, housing navigators. We were friends. And then at one point I saw like yeah, what, I, what I would consider actual law enforcement work. And since that moment, I've been saying the issue and I think part of the conversation that's being forced is that our answer for every societal ill is police. And we treat public health issues, we treat mental health issues, we treat issues of poverty and, and, and scarcity with a punitive approach. And I think what we're seeing from communities is that that just will not work. And we have to increase investments in social workers and clinicians and in housing and opportunity and, and in communities, right? So I, when I hear defund the police, that's what I'm hearing. It's really a call, not just for electors, but for society to reimagine what we think of when we say public safety and really assign people roles based on off function. I don't think cops should be social workers. I think social workers should be social workers. I don't think social workers should be cops. I think cops should be cops. Um, so, that, so that's kind of where I stand, like, particularly in communities like Stockton. Two times in the last 15 years, the voters have voted to increase taxes, despite having a medium household income less than the state's average, to pay for more policing. And even with those tax increases, we still are one of the most understaffed per capita police departments um, in this country. And I think the other thing about this defunding police conversation is also going to have to be accompanied with education as to what funds what because you have to talk to your county systems if you want to talk about social services. You have to talk about your school systems in most cities if you want to talk about school districts. And that's why there's things like Schools and Community First and other ballot initiatives on the ballot that people could support if the idea is to increase investment on many of these other things. But so I, I, I don't think I'm just taking money away from the police department and investing and in other places in and of itself is, is sufficient. I think that there has to be some work to build up the capacity of community-based organizations, to build up the capacity of mm -hmm. alternate strategies. And that can't happen tomorrow because again, we're facing real issues with things like human trafficking and, 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 and real actual crime that should be have an officer involved. I think without a real strategy around how do you build up the other inputs and supports in community, just removing cops might actually make a problem that's existing even worse. So, you know, I, I just to throw in my two cents here, I think they're, they're like the three R's that ought to be happening right now. I, I do think that we should be engaging in reforms and that is, you know, looking at use of force, looking at uh, no longer allowing chokeholds, those kinds of things. The second R is I do think we should look at reinvesting money that we initially want to go to policing into other areas in our communities. And the third R is I think we should actually be actively reimagining what policing should look mm -hmm. like in communities. Do we still want police to be occupiers? Because that's how it's they are perceived and felt, and especially in communities of color in urban settings. I think that's wrong, but uh, I think all these things are not mutually exclusive and they could be happening all at the same time. I'm gonna bring up uh, some questions now from some of the folks who are listening. 
Uh, one question, one of our audience members asked this, GOP, the GOP uses race to divide working class Americans when poor whites face in smaller form, the same issues as poor people of color. How do we get past that divide? Anyone wanna tackle mayor, that? I'll, de I'll defer to the mayor on, on to go first. Um, well, yeah, I guess I just struggle with, with, with the question because if you look at sort of Trump's voters, he did his best in 16 with his, the average income of Trump voters are, were higher than the average income of Hillary voters. And he did well in the majority of white people, regardless of, of, of income. So I do think in terms of coalition building, you would think there would be a line interest between working class white folks and working class black folks. Um, but I think the issue is really just a conversation the white community has to have about the prevalence of racism and, and white supremacy. And why do appeals to racial stereotypes, why do do appeals to sort of the other galvanize so much support. And, 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 and I think that's a conversation just about sort of how, we, how we're taught history, sort of our culture. I think it's something that it's so difficult to articulate because it's insidious and it's ubiquitous. It, it just is, and it's the society in, in, in which we live in. Um, so, because I think there have been, since Bacon's Rebellion, there's been people who saw the math and said, hey, Poor white folks, poor black folks, y'all should. Uh, poor people of color, y'all should get together. On um, the Rainbow Coalition, like throughout history, that's been a reoccurring theme. So the question has to be like, why is that not happening? And, and it's not happening because so many people, I think Tennessee Close talked about this, believes this. The, the, and there's a book right now called Dying of Whiteness. There's just a lot of people that hold on to this idea that that that, that this identity of being white is is is, is sacrosanct. It's more important than my health interests. It's more important than the national security interests of this country. It's even more important than the moral standing of this country in the world. So I think we could talk about class interests. We could talk about, but those things are readily apparent. We could talk, we have to really get to the root of it and really do some re-education around what does it mean to treat everyone equally and what does it mean to like just denounce this idea that white folks are superior because white supremacy is just not good for anybody. You know, uh, the modern GOP has its genesis in Richard Nixon's Southern strategy of 1969. And his Southern strategy was an effort to sort of take advantage of uh, white fears and white anxieties in the South over the integration of schools and the Public Accommodations Act of 64 and the Equal Employment Act provisions of the Civil Rights Bill. It, it was designed to exploit that. So the modern, GOP, the modern GOP became the home of all of the old Dixiecrats who were pro-segregationist Democrats who were in the Democratic Party for most of the first 50 to 60 years, uh, really of the 20th century. And so the modern GOP always had in it, in it, this idea and this emotional appeal of division. And the narrative was, if they move ahead, meaning black people and African-Americans, they're gonna take your jobs, they're gonna take your house, they're gonna take your status, uh, they're gonna begin, uh, it, it, they called it race mixing, was the offensive term they used it. They're gonna begin uh, interracial marriage, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the, and the, and the white race will be threatened and the standing of the white race would be threatened. And, they, and, and that was the subtle inference and then the active inference of the Nixon campaign uh, and, and certainly the Reagan movement. Reagan went down to Philadelphia, Mississippi, uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi to announce and launch his 1980 campaign for president. Uh, the symbolism is interesting, right? Uh, Schwerner, Goodson, and uh, Goodman and Cheney the death of civil rights workers in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the image of Philadelphia, Mississippi as, as, as a corner, cornerstone of segregation and, and, and racism in America. And, and, and so the GOP constructed a coalition between economic conservatives who were not numerous enough to constitute a majority and sort of uh, poor and working class whites who I felt could always be manipulated 
by you by the utilization of race, uh, by creating this competition, if you will. It's the theory of zero sum gain. It's the theory of the of of the not enlarging pie. If these black people get ahead, you are going to lose. Come with us because we will have policies and 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 the narrative of welfare moms, uh, lazy uh, people, and broken families became the narrative to seek to seek to push back on federal programs and policies, which were really part of the New Deal and the Great Society programs, which had benefited, substantially benefited poor white Americans right. uh, uh, over that narrative from the Roosevelt years to the Reagan years. And so it makes it difficult when in the DNA, that's the narrative to somehow coalesce black and white working people from an electoral coalition basis of point of view. And uh, it, 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 it's, 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 it, it is truly, truly a challenge. And it is a disappointment. I'm from Louisiana uh, to see, uh, you know, poor white Louisianians who uh, need health care, need education, need paved roads, uh, need dental care, Need 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 quality of life improvements. Uh, almost politically opposed leaders who proposed that. Uh, the governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, expanded Medicaid. Three to four hundred thousand people uh, got health insurance. Half of them, I believe, were white Americans, white Louisianians. So it, it is a sticky, uh, difficult issue. But one must understand the history of the modern GOP as this sort of coalition between economic conservatives and typically people with money uh, and, and, and people who could easily be manipulated around issues of race and the distribution of quote unquote scarce public and private resources. So it's corrosive. So Mayor, let me, let me add something. And let me add something. You mentioned something about Louisiana. You're being from Louisiana. Just yesterday, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Louisiana, her name is Burnett Joshua Johnson. She's an African American woman. She released a letter, and it went. It made it public, calling for the end of systemic racism in the legal system in Louisiana. It is an amazing letter. Anyone can see it. Again, you just can Google Chief Justice Supreme Court Louisiana letter. Um, and she's calling for, it's a call for justice in Louisiana. I have never, ever seen anything like this from any chief justice of any court in this country. It's absolutely groundbreaking, long overdue. So uh, I know I sat down yesterday and wrote a letter to her, and I'm, I'm not talking an email letter, a letter letter, and mailed it to her to thank her for having the fortitude and the courage for calling out racism in the legal system and saying nobody should remain silent. And there are things we can do. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about what yeah, just people so, can do generally. So you'll know Chief Justice Johnson is a longtime friend and ally. And uh, she sent me her letter. She texted it to me when she wrote it. She's a courageous uh, woman. She's always been a fighter for justice. You know, she's a pioneer. She's the second black to serve on our Supreme Court in Louisiana. Certainly the first black chief justice, first black woman to serve, uh, and the first woman to serve as a member of the uh, state's uh, trial court, the civil district court for the parish of Orleans. She's an incredible woman. And, 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 and that was a courageous and important thing uh, for her to do. And, and she will be retiring at the end of the year after a distinguished career of almost 40 years on the bench. So I'm, I'm so glad you raised that because, you know, I think we have to show that because she, 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 set, she put forth and took it on head on. And by, by, by all means, systemic racism is part of the legacy of Louisiana and every state in the South. And it's criminal Every justice. state in the country, actually. Every Absolutely. In the country. Everywhere. The judiciary, so, the health care right. system. So thank you let, for let raising me, 
Sure. Let me let me uh, move to get a few more questions in if we can. Um, here's one. I'm a young educator. I work to create and eliminate damaging white supremacist curriculum. What stories would you love to see told that are close to your heart or that come to mind that you wish you learned? Anything come to mind right now? And and again, if this is something I you need to think about, when I was in school, if I learned any degree of black history, any degree, because when I went to school, all the black history I learned was self-taught or learned from my parents, or learned from books on the bookshelves or from the black bookstore in my neighborhood, uh, any degree. And so I, my point of view is that the history books almost need to be trashed and put to the side and we need to rewrite the history so it's more balanced and it's more inclusive. Like, did I learn about Lewis Latimer? Did I learn about learn about Charles Drew? Did I learn about Thurgood Marshall in American history? Did I really learn about Frederick Douglass and his incredible contributions uh, when I was in school, whether I was in elementary school or high school? So I think- So I wonder, I wonder- uh, is but, here. but I wonder if that has changed. So let's go to Mayor Tubbs of another generation. So where are you on on that? No, I, I think history has to be taught in, in a way that's reflective of kind of struggle and not inevitability. So I wish, even when we talk about the Black experience, that we spend more time talking about Septa McClark and Ella Baker and, and folks like that, and not as much focus on Dr. King. Yeah, I wish we had learned more about like Denmark Vesey and, and Nat Turner. I wish we had um, learned more about just really conceptual, con contextualizing the age of the freedom writers, people like John Lewis, who are still with us today, who were at 22 years old, had led SNCC, the Freedom Rides, and spoke at the March on Washington. I wish I had learned more about Bayard Rustin, um, a, a gay man who was an architect and helped plan folks like James Lawson, a mentor. I, I just wish more of the stories were told about how everyone had a role to play. It wasn't just up to this one Masonic leader or these couple Masonic charismatic figures to do it. And, and I wish that we were taught in a way that gave us agency, that, that no, actually you have a, 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 a role to play. And, I, and lastly, I think um, to the educator, James Baldwin in his note to teacher talks about kind of lays down like what does it mean to educate children in a society where some of the messages are anti and how the best thing a teacher can do is to teach the child that the things are normal, that their feelings of anger are, are real and valid, and that if they learn how to think, they can reimagine and recreate the world that they deserve. The other thing I'll say about that, Judge, I want to say this. I think it's important, and this is this is this is implicit in this conversation, from what the mayor said and what I said. White Americans have to learn Black history uh, because the narrative of uh, the, the race, the racist narrative, is Black people have contributed little or nothing to the United States or to America, right? Uh, their contributions have been scant. Their contributions have been far, far, few and far between. Uh, and, and we have to eliminate. That's such a falsehood. It's such a bogus thing. So we need to understand it better. Uh, but, but it needs to be understood better by the entire society. Thanks. We, we have a, another question. Mayor Tubbs raised the Baldwin quote, a constant state of rage. How do Mayor Tubbs, Morial, and Judge Cordell control or channel your rage? I've got to, for me, I've got to get a lot of exercise. I have to do a lot of praying. Uh, and then I have to be involved in the work of dismantling and progress. You see, if I'm in, if I'm involved in the my work is the channeling of any anger or rage that I have. And for me, it's crucial. If I wasn't in it, then I would probably feel differently about it. But being on the front lines for a long time, I mean, I don't know what you think. It's part of how I channel, you know, how I feel. And, and right. at, at, you know, now I feel when I look at this, I, you know, I grew up uh, as a as a as a child, I think a child of hope. Uh, the first year I went to school was the first year, second year the schools were integrated, uh, and 
grew up with the hope of the civil rights revolution that it was going to substantially change things and you fast forward to where we are now and you realize things have changed and so much has remained the same and that can be very disappointing it can be daunting and it also can create a real level for people in my generation of rage and defeat uh, that uh, we could not bring about further evolutionary change in, in, in America. And that's why this movement is so, this moment, which uh, I hope transforms into a movement is so, so critical, but right. I've got to operate on a personal level. You know, I've got to channel sure. my energy right. but on a professional level. It's being involved in the construction and being, being involved in the resistance and being involved in the work. So Mayor Tubbs. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, just agency and kind of channeling that energy to pushing and, and fighting and speaking and meeting and doing everything that we can to, to, to create that, that society that we deserve. So definitely, I think to the mayor's point, it's just channeling that into agency and, and being very blessed to be in a position where I can actually do something about it in terms of the laws that are on the books, in terms of the policies that our officers have, and just taking advantage of that very unique opportunity that no other 29-year-old Black man in this country has. Wow. I have another question. Um, is there any city in the United States that is this is done right, where the police have worked on fighting racial biases and supporting community programs or other, other strategies that make a difference? Um, let me throw out the city of Camden, New Jersey, that in 2013, um, in 2013, uh, they fired everyone. They just completely dismantled their uh, police department. Everyone was fired and all the officers then had to reapply in order to join up uh, again. Uh, and they decided to, excuse me, they started again to um, uh, deal with community policing. Uh, so one statistic they throw out that is after two years, uh, the the solve rate for murders, which was very high in Camden, really high, maybe the highest in the country, uh, the murder rate, but the solve rate was only 16%. Within two years of this, they're dismantling the police department and then putting it back in a different form, I guess. The solve rate went to 61%. Uh, so that's being talked about now on all of these news programs about what happened in Camden. That's the only place I've heard of that uh, there was something that dramatic that happened. Do you all have any idea if any other place is something happening in Stockton? Yeah, go ahead, for example? I can go. Yeah, let me, I'll be quick, Mr. Mayor. I think in stock. well, I think the I, I struggle with the premise of the question because policing is not divorced from wider society. So the, the question is, is there any place in America that reflects kind of the values of the constitution wholly? And that's just not true. It's, we're, not, we're, not, we're not there yet. Um, but, but in terms of policing in particular, I think our police chief and our police department have done an amazing job similar to what Camden's done, but with, without firing um, everyone. But we were able to hire, thanks to tax measures, 120 new officers of about 430, 460 natural law force over the past four years. In addition to that, our police chief has been really leading the way in reform. So we had the highest reduction in officer-involved shootings in the state last year because we've implemented all the use of force standards and 21st century policing recommendations from President Obama. We have been doing racial reconciliation tours with our police chief listening and apologizing for the roots of policing and slave patrols. And he says that in uniform to, to, to communities. He apologizes to folks who have been victims of unjustified use of force by our police department. Um, we, all of our officers are trained in implicit bias and procedural justice, not one day, not two days, but, but all the times ongoing. And even with all of that, we still have so much work um, to do. So I think to your point, Judge, the models are out there, but I just don't want us to lose sight of the fact that what we're seeing with policing is just symptomatic of a wider structural societal issue that you can find in any institution, as Mr. Mayor knows, from housing to lending to, to health. Like in anything, you'll find Black folks, people of color with knees on their neck, and that's because it's embedded into the society and structures, and that's a wider conversation we have to have, and I'm, but, we should, but I'm glad we're able to start with the most visceral, um, which is policing. Yeah, and what you've yeah. described is exactly the definition of systemic racism. 
Uh, and, and the way I analogize it is that there are two viruses happening in this country right now. We have the pandemic and the other virus is systemic racism. Now, the, the COVID-19, uh, we first you know, became aware of it in December 2019, uh, but the systemic racism virus has been with us for 401 years, which means it has had time to infiltrate into every single thing, every institution in this country. The other analogy I wanna make is that we've been told that COVID-19, uh, many, many people are asymptomatic. That is, they have it, but they don't know they have it. And they're highly contagious, even though they don't know they have it. And that is the same with the racism virus. Uh, there are so many people in this country who have it, they are asymptomatic, they don't know they have it, and they pass it on to their family members, to their children. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that given how pervasive it all is, we really need to look at um, the cure, um, which is, brings us to the next part, the cure. Uh, the cure for the COVID, sure, we will get a vaccine in the next four to five years. No doubt, there will be a vaccine. So what is the vaccine for the other virus, for systemic racism? And in my view, the vaccine is we already have it. It is us. It is when my white brothers and sisters, along with my black, brown, yellow, red, all people, but especially white brothers and sisters understand, particularly those who have been asymptomatic, understand that they have it, they've been, they've been passing it on, and, and come to that realization. That is the cure, because you can't not do anything once you realize that you have this virus and you also are the cure for the virus. So I'll stop with that and yeah, let, I, let me get your reactions to I that. Was gonna, yeah, I was going to just go back to the previous question, because uh, one sure. of the things I'm proudest of is and because it's almost 20 years ago, was the work that we did to substantially reform the New Orleans Police Department, which was basically a much bigger city than Camden, a rebuilding. We didn't fire everybody, but we fired some 70 to 80 officers, and we completely rebuilt it uh, around a community-oriented policing model. Uh, and Why did you fire those officers? For brutality, for misconduct, for corruption, uh for 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 all sorts of things and you know we just did a house cleaning we decided we we're going to clean house uh and and we we're going to be challenged in court and we we're going to fight every case in court and we won 95 percent of the cases in court i mean we dotted our eyes and crossed our t's uh, but i had a great chief the late richard pennington who was a no-nonsense office police officer chief and we reformed the department we cut the murder rate by 60 percent we took a city which was leading the country in terms of the number of civil rights complaints down to in, an infinitesimal level. We had overhauled all the training. We overhauled the hiring process. We overhauled uh, every single element of the New Orleans Police Department. It paid substantial dividends. We had a safer city. We had better com police community relations to become a police officer. We went to a college degree preferred model. Uh, and we also created a situation where we could hire people laterally, uh, which, uh, which was also a paradigm shift. Uh, and, you know, our department at the time was probably trending towards 40 to 40% African-American in a very, in a diverse city, but it was pre, you know, this is some time ago. Now, here's what I learned. We put all of this in place when I left office, the department had national accreditation. Four years later, it had slipped right back. And it slipped back because of poor leadership. Leadership in City Hall, uh, leadership in the police department, because all the entire time we were doing this remake effort, there was also an old, always an old guard fighting, you know, fighting, fight, every way to fight in the community, politically leaking information, trying to undermine. They ran a campaign on us, an underground campaign on us for probably two years saying we were faking the crime numbers. Sounds like Trump, right? Hoax, uh, which wasn't the case. But I'll come to this. I think for racism and structural racism, there are no easy fixes. Uh, and the system that we are talking about was, you know, 500 years in the making, 
from the beginnings of slavery to colonialism to the creation of the slave trade to uh, its little brother and sister called legal segregation to its grandson and granddaughter, which is a system of modern uh, discrimination. It, it, it's not easy to undertake. And that's why I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always cautious about setting people up by saying, look, we got a protest, pass one or two bills, boom, couple of things, and everything is gonna be so much better. When this is gonna be a long-term effort because we do have to change hearts, we have to change minds, and we have to change laws, and we have to change practices, and we have to change attitudes. But my point of view is it is essential for the United States of America, uh, a country that will not have a majority ethnic group in probably 30 years, to, to, to walk this journey, to go on this, in this, this sometimes difficult, uh, uh, this difficult road, this difficult uh, mountain that we've got to climb to get to where we need to get. And I think, you know, the generation of Mayor Tubbs, you know, brilliant, uh, you know, mayor of a city who's gotten a lot of attention for his thoughtfulness. It's, you know, the generation of, 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 of Mr. Tubbs, Mayor Tubbs is going to have to really continue to carry this on for multiple generations and multiple years. This is not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy. We don't want to set people up to believe that there's a quick or an automatic fix to this. And, and this reverts back to just one of these golden moments in time. Remember the election of Barack Obama and the sense that the country had and the feeling that many of us had. And there was a false narrative created. And the narrative was that his election meant that America had become post-racial. It was false. It was, in my view, damaging to the nation and damaging to him because it set him up as though he was some sort of Superman who could you know, automatically with a golden pen wipe out the, the ails and the, and, and the ills of race and racial division all by himself. We know that, that not, that's not to be the case. Wow. So we're, we're almost to the end of our program. Thank you so much. How about our cups to us? I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. It broke up a little bit. Yeah, Mayor Tubbs, can, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. So I just like you to, we're, we're getting near the end. And we had, I mean, it was wonderful what uh, Mr. Morial just said. And I wanted to know if you have anything you would like to kind of wrap up with, uh, maybe one thing that you would like the, the public to know or to think about or to do um, at this this wonderful, very unique moment. Well, first, thank you all for this conversation. It felt like therapy and I, and I mean that and it was needed and necessary. And thank you guys for your examples as trailblazers um, and, and paving the way for what it means to lead and govern in these institutions while acknowledging that they're not perfect. Um, to, to answer your question, I think everyone has to, again, remember that this conversation may feel new, but it's not a new one, that this country has had this conversation since the beginning of this country. For the last 401 years, as, as the judge said, we have really struggled with notions of do human rights and the rights we talk about in our constitution, do they apply to everyone? And every generation or so, there's a big fight. There's a big conversation. There's a there's big unrest. There's a, there's a lot of tension that's created and confrontation around. No, we want our rights. We we want to be free. We 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 are equal. And this notion of white supremacy is bad. So in 2020, this is this this is the iteration. I think from that comes a real opportunity to continue the work that's been laid before us and advance it even even further. And, and further our understanding of what does it mean to be a civilized society? What does it mean to be uh, a, a 21st century civilization? Uh, what does it mean to really extend notions of, of neighborness so that overrides kind of notions of, of, of othering? And I think that's the work, not just of elected officials, but of each and every person. That this is not a electoral issue just in and of itself. It's not a policing issue 
is in and of itself, it is a human rights issue. And it's one that we allow as a society that we give consent for these inequities that we see. So I call on everyone to rise up, to challenge themselves and figure out what can they do in their way, in their field, with their families and with their friends to make sure, as the mayor said, this moment turns into a movement. Because if it doesn't turn into a movement, if it doesn't turn into change, then we're gonna see many moments like this. And as James Baldwin said in his book, but literally the fire next time, people are fed up, people are sick, people aren't going back to how it used to be and people aren't gonna, aren't gonna just allow us not to move. So it's all people of goodwill, we have to push together. We have to say, no, we demand constitutional protections and rights for everyone and do the hard work necessary to have the conversation, but also take the policy actions to create that perfect union. And I'm excited right. to thank you. Time. Thank you both. Uh, I uh, leave inspired by both of you. Um, and the message is quite clear. To remain silent is to be complicit. We all have a role to play. And uh, so to Mark Morial, president and CEO of the National Urban League, and Michael Tubbs, mayor of Stockton, California, thank you. This program has been co-presented by Inforum. We're also thankful to all of our viewers online. As I noted earlier, the Commonwealth Club will continue to provide virtual programming in the days ahead. Please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to learn more. I am retired judge Ladaris Cordell, and now this program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. <laughs>